Hello and welcome to the second part of our CODES Feature Briefing 2022. For those of you who have already attended yesterday's session, welcome back. You know already the procedure. For all the others, welcome. Nice to have you with us. And uh, if you missed yesterday's session and you are interested in the contents, we are going to uh, public, publish um, the, the recordings we've done and you'll receive an uh, email afterwards uh, with the links. Now let's have a look on the agenda. Um, we are going to um, uh, give the presentations not online, but we have recorded them. And so you will see the um, recorded uh, presentations afterwards. I'm going to start with the news about the codes of soft motion. Then uh, Bernhard Reiter takes over for the application, the field bus, and the communication. Afterwards, Martin Decker shows you news about the CODES automation server. Then Andreas Kehrer will give you information about visualization and safety. And finally, uh, Ulf Schünemann is going to inform you about our research project and activities. Um, to repeat this, we are um, presenting you the, the features we have developed during the last year, roughly. So those get partly uh, released with the service pack 18. Um, but as you know, the, due to the modularization, uh, the add-ons are released separately. They have an own cycle. And so we span today also these releases during the last year, roughly. Um, Moreover, we'll also give you an outlook about the features we are going to implement uh, in the next time. So partly it's already started, uh, partly it's uh, going to be started soon. Then um, we'll, after these presentations, they take roughly one hour. Um, we'll also have um, a question and answer session and um, you can, enter at any time your questions in the question window in this tool of go to webinar there's a question window where you can enter your questions and we'd even appreciate if you do it um, during the presentations but please don't forget to give us a context we need to know uh, what your question refers to uh, later it's sometimes difficult to understand to which presentation or which topic it refers to Yesterday, uh, we received some feedback about uh, difficulties with the audio output. Um, this, is, um, this took place uh, when we switched to the uh, presentation mode where we show these uh, recorded videos. And uh, uh, it seems that uh, GoToWebinar uh, switches uh, or may switch the audio output. And uh, sometimes then um, the audio output of the monitor has been used or some other audio output of your of your PC. Um, if you don't hear anything, please uh, please check the audio output configuration of Windows and um, then it should be easy to adjust this. Well, that was all for the introduction. Now let's start with the first uh, pres presentation. See you later, hope you enjoy it. This presentation is about CODES soft motion. I'm going to introduce to you the main features of version 4.11, which we have released about one month ago. It includes a new single access function block, SMC track set values. Then we have improved the CP tracking, which is the major part of this release. And also for the robotics, a new function block, SMC group read path dynamics. We added support for several new servo drives. And uh, then I would like to announce uh, three new features to you, all extending the existing robotics implementation. It's a torque determination and limitation prototype, support of modular access, and the digital switches on the path. Now let's have a look on the first new functionality, the SMC track set values function block. It is a single access function block and can be compared to those of PLC Open Part 1, like move absolute and move relative. Its functionality is to follow a given signal, respecting uh, limits for velocity, acceleration, and jerk. Uh, looking on its interface, you see we have the axis input that specifies the axis that we want to control. 
the deexecute uh, controls the state of this function block and uh, activates it with a rising edge. The busy output, the command aborted, the error and the error ID are uh, familiar outputs of uh, this class of function blocks. The be in sync output tells us if um, the axis is synchronous to the signal. And uh, the signal itself is specified by f set position, f set velocity, f set acceleration, and f set jerk, while the limits are defined with the velocity, acceleration, deceleration, and jerk input. In case of a modulo signal, uh, we can also give uh, specify the period here with the last input. The use case of this function block is that uh, it controls an axis to follow an external signal that could be uh, generated by a vision system or an encoder or any other uh, signal um, that, that is specified by another process. I have um, recorded a trace of, uh, of an example. So you see uh, the signal is represented by the blue um, trace, by the blue line, while the axis that we control with the function block is represented by the green line. In the first diagram, we see the position, then comes the velocity, and finally the acceleration and deceleration. And as you can see, the axis follows the blue signal quite well. Um, but I have um, generated an unfair advantage for the signal. I, I have allowed it uh, a higher acceleration. And that means that, at, for example, at this point and even before, the, the axis couldn't follow the signal um, because it reaches its limits. Uh, but it tries to catch up and uh, it um, tries to find the, the optimum trajectory. And finally, it uh, will, will catch up with the signal um, as we would expect. Major part of this version 4.11 of soft motion is the improvement of the CP tracking. CP stands for continuous path, and that means, in contrast to point to point robotics movement, where the interpolation takes place in the axis space. With CP, we have the interpolation in the Cartesian space. And in context of tracking, it means that the coordinate system uh, can be moving, like a moving belt, and that the robot has to synchronize or execute a movement uh, relative to this moving coordinate system, and that these coordinate systems can, can change during the movement as well. And this was already possible with the former versions of Coates' soft motion, uh, maybe not with this complete functionality, but uh, it was possible, but it needed more tuning. So it was uh, more complicated for the application engineer. We have made this very easy now and very consistent to the non-tracking uh, functionality. We improved the robustness. So we have, in general, we have a more consistent behavior. And this means also that we have an improved maintainability for ourselves. Um, I mentioned already that it was a huge effort and we had to redesign parts of our kernel, but uh, we are sure that uh, in the future it will help us to um, further improve uh, features like this and also uh, to implement uh, new, new things uh, relating to this. In order to give you an idea of the application you can solve with this, um, let's see our test machine. This is ultra slow motion and you see that the robot synchronizes with the belt, picks this brick and places it on another belt in a very smooth movement. Okay, next we have the SMC group read path dynamics function block. It's also from the robotics part. And uh, relative to the coordinate system we specify here, it uh, calculates the path velocity, acceleration, and jerk of the axis group that you enter here as an input. Then we have uh, new drivers for these 
servo drives via EasyCut, so it's a call Morgan for the Panasonic A6 and for the NIDEC are new drivers with native support. And uh, to see the complete list of all supported drives, please go to our homepage. Uh, you will find it on the product section, uh, a complete list of these supported servo drives. Finally, I promised to give you an outlook on what we will do next. Uh, for the robotics, we are uh, currently developing a prototype for torque, determination and limitation. What does it mean? So currently, the soft motion implements uh, a kinematic model of the robot, not a kinetic or dynamic model. That means that uh, the trajectory generation works based on position, velocity, acceleration and jerk. But it doesn't take into account the, the torque or force. So masses and inertia are not part of uh, neither of our current axis group model nor of our trajectory generation. And uh, But if we could um, add this support, we can predetermine the torque and force value on the motors. And these can be used for pilot control and uh, will improve the trajectory quality. So this is one part. The other part is that in practice, normally the not velocity and acceleration, or maybe sure, yes, but velocity and acceleration are not the limiting factors uh, of the mechanical part, but mostly it is torque and force for motors, for gearboxes and joints. And if we can uh, introduce and comply with limits on, on the neuralgic points, then we will be able to generate even more efficient trajectories. Yes, and finally, we have two other new features in mind that we want to attack soon. Uh, one is the support of modular axis. Uh, current soft motion robotics does not support uh, modular axis yet. You find typically a solution in your application for it but we want to add a more native support of modular axis. And second, um, the digital switches on the path. This is similar to the H switches that we have already implemented in the CNC. It means a switch is a, a digital switch uh, defined on your path, where you, for example, um, switch on a vacuum gripper or, or something else. And, uh, you can specify the switch either absolute or uh, relative on an element. And um, yeah, you also have the possibility to specify a positive or negative delay to compensate uh, for real physical reaction. Yeah, this is what we want to do next. Okay, so now um, this was all I wanted to show you. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, my name is Bernhard Reiter and I'm a product manager at Codesys. In this presentation, I want to show you the new features um, released in the application technology libraries over the course of the last year and also give an outlook over the new features still coming. At first, I want to talk about new features in the IIoT libraries of Codesys. Um, then I want to show or introduce the new building automation library, which will have its first release in the summer. And finally, I want to talk about a new simulation interface we want to introduce to um, allow a better integration between Codesys and simulation tools. In the IIoT libraries in version 1.4 during last year, we released a new a library called WebSocket Client SL. So what are WebSockets generally? We allow a bi-directional connection to a web server via the internet. There is no polling um, involved or necessary, so there is less data traffic and a faster reaction time. And this means also less data overhead between server and client. The communication works via the standard internet ports 80 and 443 for TLS communication. 
So what does our WebSocket client as a library specifically support? It supports both unencrypted and encrypted connections with configurable TLS settings. It has a configurable ping interval. Communication via an HTTP proxy server is possible and fragmented packages are supported. Building on this new WebSocket library, we enhanced the our MQTT library in the IIoT package and this enhancement is released with version 1.5. So again, the advantages of using WebSockets in combination with MQTT are that um, standard internet ports become usable for the communication. So this enables support of many internet MQTT brokers with codes and publishing and subscribing messages over the internet becomes um, possible easily now. Again, unencrypted and encrypted communications are supported via our WebSocket library and the communication with HTTP proxy servers as well. And finally, with um, the upcoming version 1.6 of, of our IIoT libraries, we will add support for MQTT version 5. So far, the library supports MQTT version 3.1 and um, you can decide for your application which version you want to use and it is switchable via an input of the function block instances. The library will support all of the MQTT version 5 features. Uh, I will talk about that in the next, next slide or give an overview of it. But here I want to talk um, about the main advantages of using the new version of MQTT. So the error handling improved and is, um, makes it more robust for systems. You have session and, and message expiry and predefined um, restrictions like quality of service or maximum package size. Um, MQTT becomes scalable by um, enabling the possibility of load balancing via shared subscriptions and also topics um, can be aliased and subscription IDs as well to reduce the message sizes and the CPU load required to decode and encode the messages. Um, also, greater flexibility is enabled by allowing user properties and payload format indicators, which um, enable a certain kind of self-describing message payloads for MQTT. Here again, an overview of all MQTT features, um, which are part of the standard and also are supported by our library in CodeSys. The next topic I want to talk about is the new building automation library, which will have its first release during summer. So what is this new library about? Um, we want to um, yeah, enable the typical use cases um, for like primary plants or boiler plants, HVAC, room automation, lighting, lightning control in general, building management and assisted facility management in the building automation um, domain. The library is oriented towards um, the known um, VDI standards um, examples are part of the library, so the idea is really that you take this library as maybe even just a starting point and adapt it to your needs and requirements for your specific project. This is also the reason why this library will be um, distributed open and source for your easy adaptation and it will also be um, free to use and available in the Cosis store. The last thing I want to talk about is a simulation interface, which you want to include in CodeSys. So yeah, what's, why a simulation interface at all? Um, the topic of connecting to a digital twin becomes ever more important with uh, industry 4.0 um, initiative and standardization. So we want to focus on the use case of uh, software in the loop simulation. We want to be able to connect to external or third party simulation software. So we're not going to provide our own simulation software specifically for this case. And the current solutions are limited. So even nowadays, um, 
there is already the need to connect to simulation software, but the options specifically in codes are limited. So you either have very high latency by using our OPC UA server or the simple configuration, or you have a very high engineering overhead because you need to set up the complete shared memory or socket communication and um, binding to the IOs of the project by yourself. And we think it should be really as easy as switching um, to a certain kind of simulation device and not having to make any other um, extensive changes to your project to being able to, to work with a simulation software. So you just either switch the complete project to simulation or you can select um, a subset of your IOs to simulate. You simulate, uh, select a backend for your simulation and then this should be all the steps necessary taken in courses to connect to your third party simulation software and um, yeah, start to to speed up your project development and hardware development in parallel. So this development will um, start this year and we hope to have um, a first usable version by the end of the year. Thank you for your attention. In this presentation, I want to show you the new features um, released for the CODES field buses during the last year. They are no longer part of the um, service pack releases as was the case in the years before the modularization of CODES, which happened with SP17. Um, still some features rely on on um, basic functionality available in the service pack and um, the symbolic access to IO channels is uh, one such feature. And um, in the second part of the presentation, I will talk about um, new features which are specific to certain feed buses. So the symbolic access to IO channels um, makes it easier to get access to the IO channels of a device. It is no longer necessary to explicitly map them using the Feedbus editor, but it is possible to combine the new symbolic access and the IO mapping editor um, in projects without any um, limitations. Um, the symbolic access needs to be enabled by a new option in the device description or the PSD settings uh, page as, so, uh, as shown in the screenshot. It allows access to all IO channels, so um, even specific uh, structured data types and enumerations are supported with this feature. And it is compatible with all existing IO drivers, so this means it can be used with all field buses already available for codes. There is no um, specific implementations or changes to be done for a field bus to support this feature. And so this is available with Service Pack 18 and any field bus installed on that version automatically supports this new feature. Here is an example showing how this looks like. So we have here the IO um, editor for a device with some um, digital in and outputs. Um, and you can see that there is no IOs mapped in the classical IO mapping editor, but still using this new symbolic access, um, you have the possibility to use um, the IOs directly in your structured text, for example, as in this case, by accessing it through the um, implicit instances created for each device by the device configuration itself. Now I want to show you um, what happened in the specific uh, field buses um, during the past year and which is on the roadmap for the, for the coming months. Um, the EWCAT safety modules supports now even more um, module types from Beckhoff. So there is, for example, the EL1918 and EL29 series, which uh, mostly only differs in the number of digital in and outputs supported. The programming is similar to the EL60 
910 or EK1960 systems. So it is done directly in the code's development system, but an add-on component is required to support these modules and make them usable in codes. Also the usability improved additionally to supporting new modules. So the IntelliSense is now a lot cleaner and really only offers the um, function blocks relevant for your use case as defined in the device description. For Profinet, um, version 4.2 is already released and the main new feature was the support of the SNMP server, which makes it possible to um, be compliant to conformance class B of Profinet. For the upcoming release version 4.3 in July, the um, biggest new feature will be the support of the system redundancy um, S2 for the controller. For Ethernet IP, version 4.2 is also already released and um, the main feature was the support for the optional quality of service object for Ethernet IP here. With the um, upcoming release of version 4.3, we will support um, LLDP so that the conformance test in version 18 um, can successfully be executed against our um, devices. And also we are um, working actively on a standalone or programmatic configuration for the adapter and the scanner. And here the release is planned for the end of the year 22. So what does standalone or programmatic actually mean? Um, it means that you can use the stack by doing all the configuration required completely in um, some ISC programming language we offer, and you do not have to use the device editors um, for even at IP anymore. We already did this for some of our other field buses like EverCard and uh, Modbus, and now um, even at IP is the next field bus which will support this um, use case. Thank you for your attention. In this presentation, I will show you the new communication features added to CodeSys in the course of the last year. As you might already know, communication features are bundled in the so-called new communication add-on, which had its, its initial release with CodeSys Service Pack 17. Also completely new was the introduction of the possibility to use Opus UA informa information models in CodeSys. The first release was rather limited in its functionality with only supporting very um, simple information models, but still it enabled to test and use the complete workflow from importing a node set XML file describing an information model in CodeSys to generating the um, corresponding IEC data types and declarations in your CodeSys project. With the upcoming release of version 4.2 in April, we extended the possibility of this feature and um, this enables you to use even more um, advanced information models and a broader range of information models. One of these features is the possibility to use the so-called built-in data types in OPC UA, like for example, byte string and localized text, especially this Two types are very widespread in all kinds of information models and supporting them is another big step in CodeSys. Also, OPC UA state machines are used rather commonly in information models and it is now supported to translate them to a corresponding IEC representation in your project as well, usually consisting of um, function blocks and uh, methods. Declaration and usage of metadata for variables is another big feature. In OPC UA, usually you have a variable which only describes a certain value, like in this example, a sensor with a data type of int32. But you can decorate this variable with additional metadata, like an engineering unit range and the engineering units themselves. 
So in this example, our sensor might be some kind of temperature measuring sensor. And you can now specify that it has a valid range from, for example, minus 10 to 50 degrees. And additionally, you could also specify, for example, that the engineering unit is um, degrees Celsius. The self-describing data is a key feature and um, it really allows uh, the usage of a broader set of information models. Still very complex models like, for example, for injection molding machines um, require features which are not yet supported um, in codes. So for very complex um, models, there is still work to do for us. Still, the customer experience is very positive. So um, customers successfully created their own information models with state machines and methods and could use them um, easily in codes. Also, um, information models were successfully migrated from another OPC UA server to our implementation in codes in a matter of um, days. And the, the customers gave very positive feedback regarding the, the usability and ease of use of this feature. Next, I want to talk about the new symbol configuration, which will be also part of the upcoming release of version 4.2 um, in the next month. Uh, the new symbol configuration um, can now be um, added to the project through the communication manager and the corresponding um, object is called there the OPC UA server. This Again, um, as you can see in the example on the right side, you can now add um, several symbol sets to this OPC UA server. And um, compared to the old symbol configuration, these symbol sets can now actually be really completely independent from one another. So um, have uh, their own set of variables and, and data types which are completely independent. Also, this editor um, had the aim of improving the usability of the symbol configuration. So um, editing data types becomes a lot easier. Also, it's um, now supported to have um, a bit of an abstraction between um, the variable names and type names in your project and the type and variable names which are exported for your OPC UA clients. Um, this has the great advantage that doing um, refactorings in your project does not automatically lead to having to adapt your OPC UA clients as well. The legacy symbol configuration can be used in parallel with a new symbol configuration in projects. This is also um, supported by the case that the old symbol configuration uses the PLC open information model and the new symbol configuration um, does not use this information model anymore, but relies on the core OPC UA types and for example, creates only a folder for um, every symbol set. Um, if you require support for the PLC handler, um, you still have to use the legacy symbol configuration. In my last part of my presentation, I want to talk about the OPC UA um, data sources. So in version 4.1 and also in the upcoming version 4.2, we fixed um, many bugs in the OPC UA data source um, specifically, which came up when customers tried to connect to um, several um, third-party servers. We also improved the usability of the wizard and the live browsing of servers, um, especially with servers having a very large um, address space or maybe um, were connected over a rather slower connection. Browsing the server could take very long and the UI gave absolutely no, no feedback about this. And this was an um, often heard complaint from customers. And as you can see in this um, screenshot here, we now added um, a real yeah, feedback about the progress of scanning such a server and also making it abortable um, so that if the operation takes too long, the, the customer has a way of, of exiting this. 
We also um, enabled a more fine-grained control of the Opus UA options for data control. So for example, in our initial release last year, it was um, only possible to use a publishing interval of exactly one second for variables. And now this interval is um, configurable in the next version. And finally, um, it will be possible to connect to servers requiring um, authorization and also um, encryption. This was in um, in part already possible with the initial release we had, but especially browsing such a server directly from the visit was not possible. You always had to import its address space by using a node set file. And this will now also be supported to directly browse the servers um, in the future. Thank you for your attention. Hello, also from my side, a cordial welcome to you to today's CodeSys feature briefing, specifically now to the CodeSys automation server. I'm Martin Decker, product manager at the CodeSys group and in charge of the automation server. Our cloud trip announced in the invitation email starts right now with the motivation why the automation server was created in the first place. Then we'll take a look at the solutions the automation server provides for you and how you or your customers can directly benefit from them. The heart or let's say the brain of any automation project is the PLC. One PLC is still easy to keep track of and channel but with multiple controllers, it quickly can become more difficult. Let's imagine a production line with a multitude of installed controllers or machines or plants that have to be monitored and managed at different locations. Along with these PLCs, there come different projects, applications over time, different versions of projects, versions of applications, various parameter settings, backups you'll have to make, firmware versions that will be necessary maybe for security reasons, certificates and different users that are interacting with the PLCs. All these users have different permissions, are responsible for different objects in your automation network. And over time, this network becomes pretty complex and hard to handle. And the question is or was, who shall, who can keep track of this? And the answer, you guessed it already, is the CodeSys automation server. Let's now have a look at the problems the automation server solves and how you can directly benefit from it. It's pretty complicated and cumbersome to securely connect a PLC to the cloud with the CodeSys automation server using the CodeSys Edge Gateway that is very easy. You only need the CodeSys Edge Gateway and it's really just a few clicks to connect your PLC to the CodeSys automation server running in the cloud. The CodeSys Edge Gateway is available for Linux devices and for Windows. You can either use it as standalone or as part of your PLC, and it ensures a certificate-based and encrypted communication all the way up to the cloud. <laughs> your benefits, you can really connect your PLCs in only a couple of seconds to the CodeSys automation server. Thus, this saves you time and money and you always have secure connections and no necessity for any third-party solutions. Another problem is a missing overview of your PLCs. You don't know their status. You don't know which firmware is running on which PLCs or which project or application is running on a certain PLC. You don't know where your PLCs are located or you don't know probably the status of your edge gateways. And the solution within the automation server are different views. For example, the gateway view and the network scan view. The gateway view gives you an overview of all available gateways that are connected to your CodeSys automation server tenant and their status. And once you have a CodeSys edge gateway connected to your automation server, you can do a network scan and find all the PLCs that are part 
of the network where your edge gateway is located in. And you can also see which edge gateway you're using, for example, and which PLCs are then within that network. Once you have added PLCs to your CodeSys automation server tenant, they're all displayed in the so-called list view. And the list view gives you instant information about the firmware version running on the PLCs, gives you information about the stages of the PLCs. They're offline, they're online, maybe in debug mode. You can also configure notifications. For example, email notifications in case your PC is offline for more than five minutes. You can create your own topology views using graphics like in this case, or your own photos, so real images you took on site, for example. You can jump into the details of each PLCs by simply pushing these buttons. You can switch between different views or you can also group different PLCs to certain PLC groups. The project and application repository is an overview of all the projects that are part of your CodeSys automation server. That means you can see which project is available for which controller and you can also use the application and project overview to directly deploy applications to your controllers using the CodeSys automation server and also get information about which application is running on which version on which controller. So for example, in this case, we can see that the version Errorfix is running on Wind Turbine 1 and the version just a test of the application is running on Wind Turbine 2 and 3. And on this one, Palm Storage Power Plant, the application is not running on that PLC at all. Your benefit from all these views is that you have a comprehensive overview of actually everything within the CodeSys automation server. And you can do a simultaneous application deployment and multiple PLCs and also add multiple PLC at once to the CodeSys automation server. Another problem is that it is very complex and error prone to establish connections to remote PLCs and the solution is to use the CodeSys automation server as remote CodeSys gateway. That means simply establish a connection from your CodeSys development system to the automation server, and then use the connection between the automation server and the CodeSys edge gateway, which is connected to any PLC on site. Once you have gateways connected to your CodeSys automation server and established a connection to the CodeSys automation server with your CodeSys development system, you get a synchronized list of all the gateways that are available in the CodeSys automation server. You can select one of those gateways and then directly connect to any PLC that's available in the Edge Gateway network on site. Another advantage of using the CodeSys automation server here is that if you once deployed an application to a PLC having used the CodeSys automation server, you can directly open the project which belongs to the application with just a single click and also directly log in to that very PLC. And your benefit is, as I said, you can open a project and log in to a PLC with just one click. Well, actually it's two clicks. Once you're logged in, you can do remote debugging, you have online access to the PLC, and you also can use the automation server to access web visualizations that are running on the PLCs from everywhere or everywhere you have access to the internet. And you can update your projects on the fly using secure connections, having no need for any configurations and especially no need for the use of any third-party solutions. It can be difficult to meet the requirements for secure and reliable rights and access control. And the solution is a fine-grained permissions management in the CodeSys automation server, a sophisticated user management, use of two-factor authentication, the support of the device of the runtime user management, and soon will be also a configurable password policy. 
So in this screenshot, you see a matrix of different uses that are available in the Kultus Automation Server, going from administrator with full rights down to no access with no rights. And all these rights for reading, writing, or creating can be applied to different objects within the Automation Server. Once you add a new user to an Automation Server tenant, you can assign a role to this user. You can then group users into user groups if wanted. And you can also assign different roles to users. For example, to the user CAS read only, you can assign an additional role operator, which gives this user additional rights of the user role operator. For example, regarding the second factor that's really easy with the automation server, as an administrator, you can force all users to use two-factor authentication but as a user, you can also decide on your own to do it. You can simply scan the QR code with, for example, an Authenticate app and your smartphone, and then you will have this second factor time-based code shown within your Authenticate app. And once you try to log in, you'll be prompted to also enter your second factor regarding the device user management. For example, once you try to add a PLC, you cannot simply add any PLC to the automation server, but you also need to have the right credentials, means username and password for this user on the runtime side of the PLC in order to be capable of adding it to your Codes automation server account. Your benefit is that you always have full control of who has access to what and when. So for example, access to PLCs or projects, applications, and so on. That means you can do all the security settings according to your needs. Another problem that still exists are the missing or insufficient or inconvenient possibilities to display, record, and analyze PLC data in a simple and appealing, but yet customizable manner. And the solution is the CodeSys Data Analyzer, which is seamlessly integrated in the CodeSys Automation Server. Here you can see some screenshots of dashboards that can be created in no time with the Data Analyzer. You have the possibility to arrange elements that shall be shown on desktop view. You can configure elements to only be shown in mobile view, and you have different elements available. So in this screenshot, you can see different meter elements to display your data, different sliders to also write or enter data, tag elements to display, read, write data, and also charts to show current data and also historic data. Your benefit is dashboards that are tailored exactly to your needs. You can create them as you want, you have convenient data processing and display of your data, and you can decide what to record and at which rate. And best is, it's intuitive. No expert knowledge is required at all. Let's now let's have a look at what will come in the future. On the bottom part, in the bottom two thirds, you see some features that are already part of the automation server. And in the future, coming from this spring and later on, are some really nice features. For example, a configurable password policy. I already mentioned that one. A sophisticated, comprehensive license management in the automation server. An update scheduler, which gives you the possibility to plan application updates for your PLCs. For example, at night, when your machines aren't running, or virtual CodeSys controls that can be part of the CodeSys automation server. More will come. If you are interested in the new features, follow us day up to date, visit automationserver.com. I hope you got some impressions of what the automation server can do for you. And I'll thanks for my side for your attention. Hello. Great to have you here. My name is Andreas Kerr. I'm product manager at Codesys. And today I want to tell you a little bit about the Codesys visualization and the feature updates, which we did with version 1.4.1. 1 
and which we will do with version 4.2 in May. So let's get started. Um, first, we want to talk about the version 4.1. There we have the movable dialogues, the X epsilon chart, and the improvements of the trend. In version 4.2, we have a new frame interface, the support of HTML5 elements, and the secure web ESO login. So the movable dialogues, as you may know, we support um, the overlay mode in our target visualization. And with this new version, we support the movable dialogues, so you can move the dialogues on the screen. You can move it to the background areas and the element invisible input where the option use as pointing area is set. The last opening position is stored for each client and each specific dialog. So it is stored wherever the dialog has been. For the X epsilon chart, um, we have now the possibility to set localized text instead of numbers for the access labeling. So um, you do not only have numbers for the for the labeling, but also texts. As you can see, for example, instead of having the numbers for the month, you can have also the the month names now available on the axis. Last but not least, the trend. Uh, we now support uh, scrolling and zooming by the mouse, by touch, whatever is supported. And we have optimized the configuration, so now you have a simplified configuration for the trend. Okay, that's it for the version 4.1. Let's go over to the version 4.2, which we have, where we have um, three new, I think, quite um, interesting new features. The first one is the frame interface. So what is the use case of the frame interface? Um, the idea is to provide an interface for the user to create a uh, visualization object, which can be used like a visualization element. That is the basic idea of the frame interface. So user can really create his own visualization elements, which can use exactly the same way than an element provided by CodeSys. So let's see what's in here. Um, we have a free designable parameter interface for visualization objects. Um, you can set initial values. Um, you can have different editor types. Um, also very important, the offline feedback is, is immediate. That means if you change the color, the font, the images, whatever, in the offline view, it's automatically also changed in, in your visualization, which gives the user an immediate feedback on his changes. And that is the, the, the backbone or the, the core information. It's the similar use as for other visualization elements. So, yeah, just an, an, an example, we can have the frame configuration, we can set colors, fonts, whatever. And then you have, you can create your own visualization element, in fact. Okay, now let's switch over to the HTML5 support. Um, what do we do? We support JavaScript-based elements for the web visualization only. So it's only really only for the web visualization. Um, of course, um, we need to adapt or adjust the JavaScript files uh, for the use in CodeSys and it is configured like a native visualization element. So again, you can install our HTML5 element inside of CodeSys and really use it as any other standard element in the CodeSys visualization. And what you get is you really benefit from browser features because the JavaScript code is executed on client side and not on PLC side. Um, you benefit from already available controls. So there is 
a real big bunch of HTML5 controls out there, which you can now integrate, easily integrate in CodeSys. And how do you do that? We will provide examples on CodeSys Forge. If you don't know CodeSys Forge, it's the open source platform from CodeSys. Okay, let's have a look on the technical side. How do you do that? You install the HTML5 in your visual element repository. Um, the editor, um, or you, you will receive an editor to, to uh, specify the content of an HTML5 control. And all you need is a quite small set of files, like an XML file to describe the element, text file, of course, a JavaScript file, images, and if needed, some, some additional files, but that really depends on your implementation. So as you can see, it's, it's actually a, a quite small set of files which is needed. Let's have a look to the, to the um, HTML5 control editor. It's uh, similar than the frame interface. And yeah, you, you just define the interface of that element, which now later is shown in CodeSys. So what are the requirements to support the HTML5 controls? Um, of course, you need a file mapping according to the scripts to the CodeSys interface that is mandatory. Um, you need a description file, which is provided with the HTML5 control editor. Um, of course, all the images you want to use, and of course, the, the additional files which you need for your HTML5 control. Okay, that's it for the HTML5 support. Now let's switch over to the secure web user login. Um, the basic idea behind of that is that you can combine the user management of the visualization with the user management of the runtime system. Um, of course, again, since we have now the HTML5 support, you can design your pure HTML5 login page. And the idea is to have only one login necessary for the device and the visualization. And here we have some example how that could look like with the HTML5 elements. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Hello, it's me again, Andreas. And now I want to tell you a little bit about Codes of Safety and the next version, version 1.7.0, which we want to release end of this year. So let's have a look to the agenda. We have two points here a new development process for safety and the features which we want to release with that new version. Let's get started. The new development process, what we want to do is we want to do a general overhaul of the development process. And this is because our safety development process was introduced from 2009 to 2011. So it's pretty old in the meantime and we found out that it's necessary to, to do an update to introduce more agile methods in our process. So what we did is we asked the TOE to do an assessment of our standard development process because the idea was to develop CodeSys safety in the exact same way than any other CodeSys add-on. The result of that assessment was that the that our standard development process is absolutely suitable for a T3 offline tool development. And with little adaptation, it's also suitable for a full safety online software development. That was, uh, of course, a pretty good result for us. So we decided to, to develop the safety version 1.7.0 with our standard development process. The benefits which we want to see from that switchover is that uh, especially all the develop developers of the company know that standard development process. 
and we can reuse a lot of well-introduced processes and tools so the the whole release should go much smoother than it was before so let's have a look to the features of that version uh, we have three main features and the first one is very important we want to split up the code to safety release in two add-ons one safety add-on for the ide and one toolkit and we want to introduce separate release cycles for it so the toolkit may be once a year and the add-on so the extension for the programming system could be released more often than the toolkit that was the basic idea of that split off the second point is the support of the 64-bit codes as you all know 64-bit is, is in the meantime the standard and of course we want to support it with our safety add-on too last but not least we have still a safety mapping child application in our safety add-on um, it is necessary to do the safe io communication and this mechanism should be also updated so that you can do io communication safe io communication without a child application that should increase the usability of our code safety solution as i already said this version is not available yet it is planned for end of this year and we are confident that that this will work okay that's it uh, thank you for your attention and if you have any questions please let me know welcome also from my side my name is Ulf Schünemann. I'm research coordinator at CodeSys Development. I'm going to tell you about our publicly funded research projects. We are researching on on-the-fly data flow analysis in Project Chicolizer. We are researching on TSN, time-sensitive networking, in Project Kitos, and we are researching on software-defined manufacturing. The Chicolizer project is concerned with error detection in the editor with on-the-fly data flow analysis. We can detect insecure flow of passwords, untrusted values by taint analysis, detect invalid settings before a method is called by tape state analysis. This research is done together with Fraunhofer Institute and CodeSys. Our contribution is to interface the analysis framework with our internal language model, to do taint and type state annotations for library functions so that the checking functions have a basis, and to display error messages and to apply quick fixes for uh, such kind of errors. The project will end in 2023. The KITOS project combines artificial intelligence and time-sensitive networks. The TSN system for this research is built with CodeSys and Bosch controllers and Hilscher NetX devices. The artificial intelligence uses configuration data and network monitoring for optimization. Three research institutes and three companies are working on this together. The use cases for TSN and automation are direct condition monitoring and logger access to field devices, PLCs with one Ethernet adapter of doing real-time and non-real-time communication, multiple edge PLCs using the same network. Our contribution is to do OPC UA pubs up communication over TSN and Ethercat and Profinet over TSN. And our controller will do time-triggered sending with the Intel E225 chip. The project will end in 2023. STM for FZI is software-defined manufacturing for the automotive industry. This is a really big project with two institutes and 22 companies. The aim is to support agile small changes of the automotive production for continuous development. The production is made flexible by definition in software. End-to-end -end engineering process from digital planning of the production and changes to it 
our automatically generated machine simulation by digital twins and automated testing and virtual commissioning in a virtual production to the virtual controllers in our edge cloud to which the new project and changes are deployed and orchestrated. Our contribution are several new functions which are connected by the process automation server. The project will end in 2024. The current state is that the automation server uh, administrates hardware controllers. New functions will be added to this administration for security and multi-cloud support and regionalization. Virtual controllers will be developed which run on a server in real time and there can be multiple ones and also safety controllers and all this administrated also by the automation server. Cloud-based engineering will be integrated, which means we have codes in the browser for developing the projects for the controllers. Cloud-based testing will be added for test development and test execution in the cloud on virtual controllers, which allows continuous integration of the changes made in CodeSys engineering in the cloud. And this will also be extended to interface with digital twins, so meaning that we have an interface to a simulation platform provided by the SDM partners and allowing continuous integration and virtual commissioning on a system level. Thank you very much.